In this film, I'm going to talk to Ashok Gupta and Dr. Tamsin Lewis about the role of the autonomic system in chronic illness, with a particular focus on long COVID. Is it just one part of the puzzle, or could it actually be responsible for all of it? Stick around, and we'll go through it in depth. If you've been following my content on this channel for a while, you'll be aware that I've highlighted a few areas of investigation for causes of symptom, and hence treatment for long COVID. As time has gone on, I've begun to see it as a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. The complicated part though is that the condition's heterogeneity means that the puzzle is different for everyone. So despite sharing many of the same pieces, some of them are much bigger in some people's puzzles than others. And what are the pieces? Well, we're looking at things like potential viral persistence or viral debris, mast cell activation, NAD plus deficiency, uh, organ damage or inflammation, autoantibodies, and dysautonomia um, slash POTS. You might be able to treat one of these and see some improvement, but it can only get you so far until you resolve the rest of the puzzle. One of these pieces I've not yet discussed at length on the channel is dysautonomia. And the more I think about it, the more this could be the keystone in the long COVID arch, potentially even responsible for all the other pieces in the puzzle. I asked Dr. Tamsin Lewis about dysautonomia in the context of long COVID. Could you tell me what uh, biologically is going on um, with dysautonomia? It's a good question because a lot of people have been banding around this term dysautonomia without, with really out, without really understanding what it means. And essentially, it means a dysfunction of your autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system, as we know, is this kind of binary distinction between fight and flight, which is your sympathetic. That's your that's your sweaty palms, that's your racing heart, that's your nausea, your stomach upset, that's getting you ready to fight. And then you've got the parasympathetic, which is your recovery. SARS-CoV-2 virus in some people seems to be very adept at triggering a huge sympathetic nervous system reaction. Now, this seems to happen not even just in the acute phase, but also in the subsequent phases. So, you know, you and I were discussing that, you know, our heart rate didn't really fly off the handle too much initially, although body temperature did. But then, you know, it seems that the inflammation that persists in long COVID can cause this dysregulation of the of the um, of the nervous system, which is what we perceive as dysautonomia. And you've discussed, you know, extensively what is what are the symptoms of dysautonomia, because a lot of people are presenting with um, um, the, ra the raised resting heart rate, um, fluttering sensation in the chest. Um, that inability to relax, you know, we're all told we should rest, we should sleep, we should recuperate. But, you know, really, we're lying there in bed going, you know, and we're developing this fear of sleep, which is, um, which is problematic, because then if we don't sleep, we don't recover, etc. So this autonomia is um, essentially, you know, that the, the, the balance is shifted towards the sympathetic, the stress state, the oxidative stress, the inflammation, etc., um, and those are the symptoms that we've we've discussed. Like, like like I said, we don't really know why COVID, the SARS COVID two virus, is very good at doing that. But um, and it doesn't appear to do it in everyone. You know, it seems that there is. You know, as you, you've already alluded to, there's all there's a genetic component here for sure. There's a lifestyle component for sure. You know, your history of stress, your ability to buffer stress, your stress bucket, etc may make you prone to these symptoms, but they can be very disabling. Um, and, it, it, but there is hope, you know, we do know how to treat it now. Many people have put on, you know, sympathetic nervous system blockers like propranolol, which block adrenaline and related components, which drive that process. There are things like breath work, which we discussed before, um, which can really activate the parasympathetic branch. So if dysautonomia is implicated in long COVID, what are the implications for treatment? Well, Dr. Tina Pears has previously been recommending the Gupta program to her patients. So I spoke to the founder, Ashok Gupta, to try and find out some more about it. Ashok Gupta describes his program as a brain retraining neuroplasticity tool, and it's all based upon a working hypothesis for how a number of chronic conditions, uh, from ME and fibromyalgia to long COVID, affect the body. 
so could you describe some of the bi biological mechanisms which are actually going on that is creating what is behind the symptoms we find in these chronic conditions? Generally in these conditions, and let's take long haul COVID, people may have had a viral trigger, in this case, COVID-19, in the case of fibromyalgia, it might be a pain syndrome, in the case of ME-CFS, it can be flu or stomach bug, some kind of physical trigger combined with uh, some kind of chronic or acute stress. Now, the chronic or acute stress isn't always there in every patient, but we generally find in a lot of patients, probably about 60 to 70 percent of patients, there's some kind of severe stress going on. And a combination of those two things combined with a genetic predisposition mean there's what we call a conditioning event that occurs in the brain. And what we mean by conditioning event is there's some neurological learning that occurs that essentially because the body was in a weakened state as a result of that stress, chronic or acute, the brain thinks I actually may not survive this particular condition. And this is directly analogous to COVID-19, which is a life threatening condition. And especially when we, the body knows that thousands of people are dying from this every day across the planet, um, the, uh, the resistance to it, the defensive structure systems, such as the immune system and nervous system will over respond. And we know with COVID-19, many people are passing away and dying, not from the actual disease itself, but from the overreaction of our cytokine storms and, and various other things. So this idea, these ideas have, uh, you know, a premise in mainstream science as well. So the body is trying to fight off COVID-19, but is in this weakened state for whatever reason. And at that point in time, the brain makes a decision, I may not survive this, therefore I must now go into extreme survival mode, overstimulate all the defensive resources. And what happens is when the brain is in that neurological state, and there is uh, quite a lot of research on this, the amygdala especially and the insula, they are prone to learning new defensive uh, processes to keep us alive. So in that moment, um, the brain is over responding, the original virus goes, so we may not test positive for the original virus anymore, but our bodies are now in this altered state. So that anything that reminds the brain that we may still have the presence of the virus, for instance, symptoms in the body itself, so fatigue, extreme exhaustion, the breathing problems, even the breathing problems can be a conditioned trigger that then trigger the immune system and nervous system to say, we are still in danger, the virus is still present, we must continue to elicit these defensive inflammatory responses. So the brain then triggers um, widespread inflammation in the body and in the brain. Uh, there can be uh, uh, ongoing stomach challenges from tightness in the gut and shutdown of digestive systems, which then change the balance of good and bad bacteria, muscle tension and fatigue, pain in the body, the breathlessness that occurs as a result of sympathetic overactivity and some of the damage that may have occurred in the lungs. All of this can create the symptoms in the body. These symptoms then loop back to a hypersensitized brain that believes we're in danger. The brain says, I knew it. I knew we were still in danger. Once again, we believe these processes occur in the amygdala and the insula, but it's not just those two brain structures, it's the entire brain working together. Stimulate the nervous system, immune system, create symptoms, loop back to the brain, and we create this vicious cycle. And uh, in mathematics, physics, as we know, uh, ups and downs or a cycle, a waveform occur when the inputs and the outputs of the system are connected. And that's how we get waveforms. And in the same way, people have good days, bad days, good moments, bad moments, which reflect how vicious the cycle has become and how many symptoms have been uh, created. So in a nutshell, that's the hypothesis. So when, for example, I have a day and I do too much in that day, whether it's mm -hmm. cognitive or whether it's physical, um, and those limits are now extremely low <laughs> from where they were before I had COVID, uh, at some point, whether it's um, possibly within minutes, but more often within sort of 12 to 24 hours, um, I get post-exertional malaise, which for me is a really sort of banging frontal headache and a complete and utter exhaustion. What's what's physically happened there? What's the link between that level of um, activity and the reaction? Yeah, so post-exertional post malaise has been obviously studied in ME and chronic fatigue syndrome uh, type uh, scientific studies for many, many years. And, you know, in, in my view, the very simple reason for that is if you continually in the background stimulate your sympathetic nervous system and your immune system, that is using up resources. So it's using up 
uh, neurotransmitters. It's using up some of those stress hormones and uh, even the neurotransmitters, which means that when you do then go to do an activity, physically, mentally, emotionally, there aren't enough resources for the body to be able to cope with that situation. It's already exhausted at, at a kind of conceptual level. And therefore, when you do those activities, you're pushing the body beyond its boundaries of what it can manage in terms of the resources required. And we know that with MECFS, there's downgrading of the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So the body isn't able to stimulate enough cortisol or enough adrenaline to deal with a physical exertion. And then there can be delayed reactions because when we exert ourselves, normally there's a sympathetic response and then a corresponding parasympathetic response, which is the rest, heal and digest response. So the muscles get repaired, whatever damage has occurred as a result of the exertion, uh, hormones and neurotransmitters are replenished and we get back to balance again. But in this situation, we know that that's not occurring. We're stuck in that sympathetic mode. And therefore, 24 to 48 hours later, sometimes the real effects of that exertion start manifesting even more severely. Um, it's interesting what you say about that HPA axis and the deficient adrenals and the lack of cortisol and the rest of it. Um, I respond extremely well to corticosteroids <laughs> with long COVID. Um, whilst I'm having them, the fatigue lifts, my head is clearer, everything's fine. I'm much more a uh, activity tolerant. Um, I can do things that I wouldn't be able to do and not suffer normally and not suffer post-social malaise. And I mean, this does seem to, in my opinion, it, it ticks a lot of boxes in terms of what we're seeing fundamentally. Um, uh, yes, and it's the brain's logical decision to downgrade the HPA axis. So it's the idea of, you know, if you keep punching a system to stimulate, it will downgrade its responses to cry, try and create homeostasis in the system because it said, I'm, I'm getting too many signals. But in that downgrading, when you do need your energy, it's not able to give it. And so when you're getting those supplements, you are artificially and temporarily supplementing the body's responses. But what we're trying to do is go to the root cause and rebalance the entire system so you wouldn't need those. Yeah, of course. Um, so can you tell us how the Gupta program actually treats uh, long COVID, for example? Uh, yes, so the way the Gupta program works is it's 15 interactive video sessions and about 20 audio sessions, which are all available online or on a USB stick if people don't want to use online. And it comes with a book as well. And people work through the videos. We, we hold people's hands through the process. So it's even if people got a lot of brain fog or not a lot of energy, they can take it very slowly, step by step in their own time, which is very important. And uh, we start off with the, the three R's of the program. So retraining the brain, most importantly, relaxing the nervous system, the supportive techniques, and thirdly, re-engaging with joy. And the core of it is understanding the unconscious signaling from the, the limbic system and from the insula, which are telling us that we are in danger. And once again, we're very clear to say these aren't psychological techniques. Yeah? Although we're not using drugs or surgery, these are what we call brain rehabilitation or brain retraining type techniques, um, taking advantage of neuroplasticity. And so a patient understands and learns what those signaling, what that signaling represents, and then does something different as a seven step process to retrain the brain. And we have other brain retraining techniques and they're supported by things like meditation and breathing, which we know increase neuroplasticity. So that's the reason for, for those supportive type techniques. And there's obviously holistic health practices like good sleep hygiene, a good general anti-inflammatory diet, those kinds of things, which support uh, the brain retraining. Because there's no point retraining your brain if you're drinking 15 cups of coffee a day. <laughs> you know, that's not going to uh, have the impact that we require. Um, so that's the core of the retraining. And we also have 30 or 40, you know, 30 trained coaches around the world that can support people one on one. And there's also weekly webinars with myself where people can ask me questions and work through it. So that's how it works. Now, if you know me, you'll know that I come at every subject from the side of science. Uh, so I asked Dr. Lewis about her take on the fundamental principle of neuroplasticity. And as a psychiatrist by sort of training and practice, um, what's your perspective on neuroplasticity as a concept? The idea of it is, is that your neuronal connections, which can be brain or your nervous system, aren't hardwired, right? They don't come together and then meet there. And then, you know, that's, that's determined. There is this 
growth concept where you we are dynamic with our environment a bit more that our, our brains and our nervous systems are more reactive to the environment more plastic more moldable and that's where plasticity comes from is this concept of being moldable um, and that's exciting because it means you know diseases that we thought of as potentially fatalistic, you know, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neurodegenerative disorders, potentially more modifiable than we otherwise thought. Depression, anxiety, other um, mental health um, conditions also. I then asked Ashok Gupta about the responses he's seen from long COVID sufferers who have joined his programme so far. So I can give you some uh, case studies which really bring uh, some colour to it. So one of the first COVID patients that we treated uh, summer last year was a lady called uh, Sandrine and her story is in fact on our website. So she contracted uh, COVID in March 2020 and she was essentially bed bound. So she she really couldn't do anything um, and right until July 2020. So she started our program and within I think four to six weeks she was going from bed bound to be able to walk um, about four to six kilometers a day. Um, and she so she got up to about 80 percent recovery in four to six weeks. Uh, there's a lady called um, Alison who's uh, recently contacted us, um, is happy to share her story. Uh, so she started the program towards the end of February. Um, she was severely affected. She's an occupational therapist. And within, I think, 10, 10 days to two weeks, she got up to 90 percent recovery and has gone back to work. Now, inevitably, as she's gone back to work and we don't want people to be complacent. Um, some of the stresses and strains begins to trigger some of the mild symptoms again. And so a lot of our program is teaching people not just to get well and retrain their brains, but to stay well, to make sure that their bodies don't go back into this altered state. Yeah. Um, then we have a, a, another lady in Florida. Uh, once again, she's up to 95% uh, recovery uh, within months, within a couple of months of, of starting the program. Um, and, and in a given day, what might... I need to do if I want to be you know is it am I spending four hours sitting there going mm, or is it <laughs> how, how do people integrate the actual needs of the program into their lives is what I'm trying to say yes so the minimum requirement that we have is a minimum of 30 minutes a day which I'm sure everyone can manage if they are living with a chronic condition that they want to change and secondly there are techniques that people conduct throughout the day and it easily fits into whatever lifestyle people are experiencing so we've had people from being bed bound or people working full-time or part-time who are still able to integrate the Gupta program into their lives so there's a lot of flexibility built in there now obviously with any program the more effort and the more commitment you make to it the better the results that will come and the, the most common problem we have is people retraining and having that commitment then they get to 70 80 percent recovery and they think great I've done it you know I'm there and then they too quickly go back into uh, a rushed life a busy life part of our modern existence and they push themselves too hard whereas we say get up to that 80 90 95 percent recovery and then slowly ease yourself back into those work situations yeah um can you tell me a little bit about some of the clinical uh, research uh, demonstrating, you know, the efficacy of the program? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we very much want to go down the scientific road of proving this rather than just saying this works. And so we're very pleased that late last year we published a randomized controlled trial on our treatments, uh, specifically for fibromyalgia patients. And the study was essentially an eight week intervention, which is very short because normally we say a minimum of six months intervention. It's an eight week intervention. And the control group was relaxation techniques and a, an equivalent amount of uh, practitioner time. And this was just published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. And it showed that in the control group, there was no impact on fibromyalgia scores or the FIQ scores. But in the active uh, Gupta program group, there was close to a 40% reduction in fibro scores within uh, eight weeks. Uh, there was a halving of anxiety and depression. There was a halving of pain and a 50 percent increase in functional capacity. And the control group was about I think it was about five or 10 percent increase in functional capacity. But now group uh, are approaching 50 percent increase. So far more effective. So this is a groundbreaking result, really, for uh, this type of treatment. We are the first neuroplasticity brain retraining program to actually have uh, a randomized control trial published. And we're pursuing phase three trials now with several centers around the world to finally prove this on a larger scale. And that's really for ME chronic fatigue syndrome, which is where we started. 
fibromyalgia, but it's also been shown to be highly effective for some of those mold and chemical sensitivities that people experience and obviously long haul COVID. Now we're just kicking off a long haul COVID study in the US with around 200 patients and that will be a three month intervention study. And we'll, let's see, you know, so for us, once again, it's let's go down the scientific route, let's prove this and um, let's see what the results are with patients. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Because you're not a doctor, um, no. but I know we've spoken before and you came from having had an experience of ME yourself um, and recovering from that. So can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to develop the GUPS program, actually develop some of the techniques and learn what you needed to learn in order to actually put this thing together? Uh, yes, of course. So I was studying as an undergrad at Cambridge and it was my second year. Um, like most students, I was burning the candle at both ends, pushing my body far too hard. And I went to India on a holiday and I contracted some kind of very severe stomach bug. And I came back to the UK. The stomach bug seemed to reside, but the intense uh, symptoms of having an infection continued. And they got worse and worse and worse to the point at which I was often housebound. I found it difficult to uh, get out of bed. Um, I couldn't focus or concentrate on a, a book, even reading something, couldn't take anything in. And obviously had to then you know, abandon my studies at that point in time for that year. And that really started my quest to say, I really want to understand what it is because I went to doctors, I went to experts and they said, look, there's nothing much we can do. You probably have this thing called MECFS, you know, look after yourself, eat well, pace yourself. But that's pretty much all that we can do for you. And I said to myself, if I can find out what is causing this, if I can get better, I will spend the rest of my life helping others. I made this kind of contract with the universe that, you know, that's what going to be what I dedicate my life to. And so I researched a lot of brain neurology, um, read a lot of medical papers, uh, various books on chronic fatigue and these associated conditions. And I especially studied the work of Professor Joseph Ledoux, who at the time was a real expert in the amygdala and its responses. And I came up with a hypothesis of what I believed caused the condition. And randomly and ad hoc, invested in certain ideas, certain ways of retraining my brain. Managed to get myself better, it was a very up and down process. And then wrote my medical paper in 1999, which was then published in the journal Medical Hypotheses in 2002. Um, and then I set up a clinic in 2001 uh, to treat other patients. And obviously, there's a big difference between working on yourself and working with other patients. So it's, it took me many years to really refine these tools and techniques to find what worked for most people most of the time. And in 2007, uh, we published the first neuroplasticity training program, which was a DVD program at that time. And uh, then in 2010, we published our clinical audit. So that didn't have a control, but that was following 33 patients for a year using our treatment. And we found two thirds of patients reached an 80 to 100 percent recovery within a year. And that was a published piece of research. And um, after that, there were obviously many other types of retraining programs that uh, appeared um, afterwards. And then we revamped our program in 2019 and obviously published our research then in 2020. So that's been our uh, journey. And as you know, it's very difficult to get studies in this particular area because it's seen as complementary or alternative. But I really hope that we can partner with the mainstream medical profession to say this is no longer an alternative treatment because these types of uh, ways of working are already used in certain areas of medicine. And I give the example of phantom limb pain. Using novel retraining techniques, they're able to train the brain to no longer believe there is a leg there and, and stop the pain signals. Yeah, now that isn't psychological. That isn't something alternative. There is a very, there's a deep scientific basis as to why that works and how that works. Now we're still different to that, but the same principles uh, occur, which is through repetition, through, then that is what retraining is, it's repetition. We learn anything new through repetition. Through repetition, we are able to train the brain to no longer be in this altered state. Now, the reason we can't do it overnight is because you are retraining a survival response, which is the equivalent of you putting your hand on a, I don't know, hot stove and training your brain not to move the hand off because actually it's cold. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're training your brain to do something it's not used to doing, but it can be done. Many people have done it. And then we find that gradually the system comes back to balance. And often people are on supplements. They're on this, that and the other. And actually, when they retrain, they come off all of those supplements and they don't need them anymore because 
the body itself, when it's in its optimal state, can provide whatever it needs. It can detoxify the way that it needs. It doesn't need external support. Can you tell me um, a little bit about your goal, in a sense, for the future with um, with this? I mean, I, when we spoke on the phone, you mentioned a little bit like you're not that fussed about, you know, holding on to the IP. You know, in mm. five years, would you say be happy if the NHS was using these tools to treat people and suddenly, you know, this wave of a million people have long COVID in the UK alone, let alone the world? Like, what's your vision for the work that you've done? The vision for me is to, first of all, get the phase three trials to prove it works, just like we have with you know the vaccines and everything like that, to really objectively show this works, because we're not going to have any <laughs> luck with the medical profession until we have that. And we've already got some studies, but we need larger studies. That's the first step. Once we have that, our aim, as I said, is not to hold on to this and say, right, this is only the Gupta program. This is about really delivering this to as many patients as possible, as quickly as possible. So our team would love to train existing therapists and coaches and practitioners who are seeing patients within the NHS and, and global health systems, train them how to support patients through using these tools and techniques and get this out there as quickly as possible. Because yes, although we don't like to tell our patients this because it's, it creates a, a resistance, the sooner that we can get to this, the better the outcome. So definitely within the first year, we find with patients, if we can get to them early, there's less entrenchment in the brain and it's a quicker and a quicker and easier a process of getting better. Yeah. Um, so that is our aim is to, to get this out there, train uh, as many people who are interested in delivering this as possible and make it a mainstream treatment. And if we get a phase three trial, and it shows the same results as our pilot trial, you know, 40, 50 percent changes in many different parameters within two months. Of course, the NHS, of course, mainstream medic medicine is going to want to take this on and roll it out because it's the ethical thing to do. I wanted to get Dr. Lewis's take on this. Where does the medical establishment sit regarding, um, you know, let, let's say, you know, the neuroplasticity programmes like the Gupta programme um, as treatments for chronic conditions? I think alternative medicine as a whole in the NHS is being more um, embraced because, you know, we're seeing the model of chronic disease being treated by the NHS is failing essentially because of the time burden and that we know that behavior change is massively important in determining chronic health outcomes. So I think there's a general shift to, to include it more, um, but there's also a hesitance um, to use that word around quality of care. You know, the, the, the spectrum of practitioners that um, are alternative um, and that kind of um, uh, the the framework there, the sort of the paradigm of evidence based medicine, it's very difficult to to prove um, interventions, essentially, a lot of the time. And I think that's what someone like Ashok Gupta has done well. You know, he's because he's you know an ec economist by background and he's a very smart guy. He's got the data and he's proved his intervention has favorable outcomes and that that's great because as soon as they do that you know I have my professor friends in Seattle saying oh have you seen this dynamic neural retraining works and you're like well it's been coated in a different layer of what it is and then and you know someone very organized has put it together um so I do think these things can really benefit some people but as you've learned as I've learned with long COVID and you know our histories and athletes probably help a bit with this is that consistency of behaviors over time really do impact how you feel and function. But you need to almost devote your life to being better and to being well. Um, and, you know, with an athlete history, you used to do this. You used to put the training stimulus in and then you had the recovery period. And this is it with life now. You know, you have to wake. You have to look at what you're eating. You have to look at your morning sun exposure. You have to do a number of things in the day to work on your well-being and it's not a nice fluffy self-care well-being to have it's a it's mandatory and, and and that is frustrating for a lot of people because we're still looking for a long covid cure and you know i i really don't think there will one there will be one thing one tablet one anything that cures it because the systems in our body has gone array um and I think that what the Gupta program, just to go back to that, using 
I mean, he uses a lot of very powerful meditations, breath work, illness reframing, you know, because we're all kind of, well, not all of us, but, you know, it is because of the groups, because of the communities, we are identifying with the illness and therefore we become almost, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy of if I go for, you know, a 10, a 10 minute walk, I'm going to be tired or 10 miles, whatever that number is. So it's trying to slowly challenge and bring safety, cell safety, back to to our to our self, to our being. Um, so the way I've been looking at um, long COVID recently is that it's a um, a puzzle with a number of pieces in it, which you know include things like you know is there viral debris? Bruce Patterson has recently been. Uh, hinting that, that he's found evidence of viral debris. Is there viral persistence? Um, to what degree is mass activation involved on adipose deficiency or dysautonomia? And all of these things are sort of floating around in this puzzle. I spoke to Ashok and he seemed to suggest that this overstimulated amygdala that was you know, uh, propagating the sympathetic nervous system was upstream of all of these. And all of these issues uh, were sort of downstream of that. So if you can actually you know, resolve that um, overactive amygdala, I mean, that's not probably the right way to describe it, but if you can resolve that problem at the top, then the rest of the stuff resolves with it. What's your instinct on that? What does your instinct tell you um, about that puzzle and about this kind of work and the effects it could potentially have for people with long COVID? I think it's, um, I think what you said there is, 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 is interesting because when we talk about the amygdala, we talk about a brain region, but I still think people are going to take away from it that it's in your head as in this illness is in your head um and and there's still be this binary sort of cut off at the neck when actually as this word dynamics you know we are constantly dynamic you know our brain is a center for not just emotional control psychiatric control behavioral control all functions of our body come from our nervous system so for sure the amygdala plays a central processing role and that amygdala is impacted by your history, you know, any previous trauma, um, any previous infections, anything that's previously been traumatic or scary to the body will prime that amygdala. So there is definitely something in reprogramming those that interplay, but it's dynamic, right? There's still coming up from you, which is, you know, there's some clotting stuff going on here. There's some really nasty cytokines flying around. Um, and the brain is, so one of the things, one of the ways I think my antihistamines are working in this and the mast cell stabilizers and, and are by sort of suffusing that mediator to stop them going and being sensed by the amygdala and therefore your body kind of goes, oh, you know, I'm safer, I'm safer and safer. And I, I really think that that is playing a role for sure. Um, and, you know, the more that we can get tests out that measure, and, and I, I think it's the same person that you mentioned, Bruce, looking at different inflammatory cytokines as a sort of signature pattern for long COVID, because we're not there yet. People are fed up with the test being normal. Um, we, you know, we'll be able to track um, how these various interventions um, can, can impact. But, you know, um, we also need to be more objective about our symptoms. I know some people are using Tina's um, recommendation, the people with that can be quite interesting to objectify your symptoms, um, etc. So I do have to point out that the Gupta program is a paid service, although there is a 28 day free trial. It makes me a bit uncomfortable to recommend things that people have to pay for, especially when so many long haulers have found their incomes massively impacted by their illness. So I can't say, you know, do this, it'll definitely work, but I can let the evidence that's out there speak for itself and you can make the right decision for you. Let's say you don't want or can't afford to sign up. Uh, what else could you do if this hypothesis uh, has anything going for it? And personally, I think it does. So essentially, anything that you can do to calm down the sympathetic nervous system and promote the parasympathetic nervous system is worth doing. So breath work, meditation, yoga are all very positive things to be doing. And dare I say it, but Paul Garner's favorite, positive thinking. It's very easy to get stuck in negative feedback loops when you're suffering with chronic illness, so anything you can do to interrupt those is worth doing. 
As for what is breath work, well, try doing 10 minutes of slow breathing in the morning, uh, in for four, um, out for six, and repeat. Um, and then in the evening, um, what I personally do is in for four, um, hold for four, out for six, hold for four. And that's basically an extended out breath version of what's known as box breathing. And then anytime you feel anxious, stressed, or like you've been on the go too long, try and find a few minutes to sit down and do it again. I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now, along with some of the meditations from the Gupta program, and it has 100% uh, helped me drop my resting heart rate from what was tachycardia essentially at 80 or 90, back down to about 60-ish, which is where I'd expect it to be. So it's definitely been a positive experience for me. But as for the big question, is dysautonomia sitting at the top of the symptom tree raining down coconuts on all of our systems in our body? Um, well, I can't answer that just yet. Um, but on the chance that it just might be, it's probably worth all of us trying to do something about it. Until next time.